And I am glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Listen, I want to start out today before I have prayer with you, just to tell you that I have been in warfare, spiritual warfare. Um, you ever have a time where you know for sure, I mean, there's just no denying that the enemy's assaults on you are amped up, that he, he's just picked up things against you? I'm in that season in the moment, um, and <clears throat> this morning, well, last night and this morning, I, I was feeling, I was fighting discouragement, and uh, I received a, a text this morning in between coming from Neosho to here. And I just want to share this with you because God knows, he knows everything. So the text says, preacher, don't know why you need prayer today. Holy Spirit won't let me rest. Love you. So then I text back, surely it is the living God who's giving you such insight. Then... I get returned to me in a text. My almighty God, concerning your servant for his mind, body, soul, and strength, as he needs, Lord, please encircle him with your protection. Fight his battles for him. Heal him as needed. Bless him as he does your work. Empower him to slay the evil one and his workers. Father, these tears are urgent. Make your presence known today. I know you are real. I was in your presence. Your power is awesome. Place your love on Jeff now. It is all sufficient. I know. I love you, Lord. Amen. And I just received that on, on the way today here. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes behind. My God, who I serve, is a mighty and living God. And he knows and he cares about each one of us. And it is good to be in his house today. Today I've entitled the message, Give Me Liberty. Shall we have prayer? Oh, Father, I, I want to thank you for being a God who is involved with us personally. I want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together and gather here in this place with other believers and worship you. And I pray, Lord, that as this message is proclaimed today, that your Holy Spirit will be upon me and upon each of these, my brothers and sisters, and that you will have your way in this place. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. So... <clears throat> We are right upon a uh, national holiday. Which one is it? I hear a lot of July 4th. That's when it is. What is the holiday? Independence Day. Independence Day. And uh, I just want to tell you that in my, most of my life, I have celebrated Independence Day by you know, festivities. Um, get together with family or friends. We have some fun food. Maybe we do some games or something like that or go to some place together. And eventually we'll watch some fireworks and ooh and ah. And we enjoy that. I've always liked the 4th of July, Independence Day. But you know, 
And, and as a kid, I always had family reunion on the 4th of July. But there's been way too seldom have I actually thought about the meaning behind Independence Day. Way too seldom have I thought about what those fireworks were actually representing as, you know, lives were given to give us the freedoms that we enjoy. You know, I want to remind you, church, that today, <clears throat> today, I'm sure of this, that there was nobody here who had to try to, like, sneak past some soldiers or something like that to get to church. You didn't have to do anything covert. You of your own volition decided, I am going to church today. You came, and here we freely gather, and here we openly read from the scriptures, and here we publicly profess the name of Jesus Christ, and it is a freedom that we often take for granted, but it is ours. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad that we exercised it today and that we're here gathered. And I believe God has something that he wants to impress upon us today. I want to start by referring to these words, give me liberty or give me death. You recognize that, that saying, right? Who said that? Patrick Henry. Some of you realize that. Patrick Henry, in his great rousing speech in the second Virginia Conne uh, Convention, he was trying to rally people to the cause of not letting Britain, like, talk about peace with them and stuff, but to fight. In this meeting were two future presidents, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. They were also delegates at this meeting. And here, Patrick Henry spoke with deep conviction and great emphasis about the need to fight. And I want to share with you just, just a few. This is a long speech, so I'm not going to read it. I'm going to share with you just a couple of sentences so that you can get a feeling for what he was talking about. In this one sentence, he says this, For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. Okay, so that's how he's looking at this. What we decide here now is a question of freedom or slavery. Right? And later on in his speech, he says this, Listen to these words. It is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. So what, what is he saying? We have to keep fighting. We can't make peace. If we retreat, the only result is going to be that we submit to them and we get in slavery again. Right? And then... He goes on and he says, our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come, I, I repeat it, sir, let it come. And then he finally says, later on, I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. This was a man who was fighting for, speaking from conviction about fighting for rights. Isn't that right? And there was something that was deeply, deeply impassioned. What was he fighting for? What was so important? And, and I just want to remind you here. He was fighting for freedom from civil tyranny. Freedom from religious tyranny. And I want to ask you, first of all, when, when the pilgrims came over from England, <clears throat> what does that have to do with civil tyranny? What are we talking about there? 
the king. Somebody said the king, I heard, right? And the king was lording it over the people so that one person's making decisions for multitudes, right? And so it's freedom from civil tyranny that they were trying to escape and also freedom from, from religious tyranny. Now, what was the religious tyranny that was going on? Pardon me? State church, and especially, I, I want you to realize what was happening during this time. <clears throat> we have a king and we have a, a pope. And remember, this, was, this speech was given actually in 1775 where Patrick Henry made his appeal. 1775. And this was still during the period that was known as the Dark Ages, which goes from 538 till when? 1798. So this is still during the end of the Dark Ages period, right? When he's giving this, this speech and this call, because he wants to break away from civil tyranny, and he wants to break away from religious tyranny. Especially, does he want to break away from, see that at the bottom? Separation. I mean, he wants to have separation of church and state. Because somebody said it about a state religion, right? Now, why is a state religion a bad thing? Why, why would there be a, a call against, you know, state and church being combined? A, a call for separation of them. Why is that important? Because the state shouldn't be able to tell the church what to believe or what to practice. Isn't that right? I'm going to tell you something. Today, you got to choose which church you came to. Happy Sabbath, by the way. You got to choose that you would honor the fourth commandment and come and gather together, not forsaking your, the, the assembly, right? But, but coming together to worship the creator God on the day that he set apart. You got to choose that. You got to use your own personal convictions about what you believe from the Bible. And no one was forcing upon you some way to believe or practice your religion. And to, so today we live in some still, some relative peace and freedom concerning that. Right? We can thank God for that. But I want you to recognize that this freedom, as all freedoms, is not free. It didn't come free. There was an immense price. Many, many lives lost. Much blood spilled. To provide you and I with the freedom that we are today exercising in this moment. Right? Patrick Henry thought that it was a cause worth dying for because he was tired of bondage. He was tired of oppression. He was tired of coercion. He was tired of all of the suffering that comes from the tyrannical leadership in both civil and religious arenas. And you know what happened. They were stirred. They were roused. They decided to continue the fight. Even though, <clears throat> even though Britain was the much stronger, more organized, better equipped army. But the battle doesn't always go to the strong. Sometimes the battle goes to the brave. Sometimes the battle goes to the one who is living out of conviction and fighting from their heart. Sometimes the battle goes to the one who has a very strong friend. Today, in these United States of America, our freedoms are eroding. The freedom of speech is eroding in this country. Especially under the guise of political correctness. 
It's not nice to say those things. In fact, it's wrong. It's discriminating to say those things. How about the freedom to bear arms? Now listen, I realize there's, there's two sides to this issue. And I recognize that, thank you so much. I recognize that, you know, we just look at what happened in, in Orlando and we, we say, man, how does some guy who has had the FBI on his trail get a hold of these kinds of weapons so he can do, go do mass destruction? That's crazy. That doesn't seem right. And yet, at the same time, we must recognize that there is something important about the everyday, ordinary person being able to bear arms. In fact, if the everyday, ordinary person was not entitled to bear arms, there would be no protection against civil tyranny. None. And, but, you know, hey, I mean, that wouldn't happen in these United States because we have a constitution that protects us from such things. But you know how the Constitution has been ignored and attacked and reinterpreted and all of that stuff, right? So what am I saying? Everybody should own guns? That's, that's, not, my, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have a right to bear arms. We have the freedom of religion that's been being attacked too. How is that? Do you see any of that? Are, are people uh, being attacked in the way of their religious freedom? Yeah. I don't know if you listen to any religious news, but for, for example, there's, there's always on certain programs people that have to, um, it, whether they're in school or they're in the workplace or something like that, they have to fight in the legal system to be able to have certain religious practices in their lives. And I'll tell you something, um, the freedom of religion that we now enjoy, I think this is probably about as free as we're going to be right now today until Jesus returns. Because these things are eroding. You understand what eroding means, right? That, like kind of washing away, spilling away. You know, you've heard somehow, you've heard people talking about California keeps falling off into the ocean, stuff like that, right? It's, it's eroding and that's what's happening to our civil liberties and, our, and all of these freedoms. The freedom of speech, the freedom to bear arms, the freedom of religion, the freedom of press. People can't even write the things that they used to be able to be free to write. And the freedom of assembly. Like right now, today, you and I, were free to come and gather here. I'm using the freedom of speech. I'm exercising it even now. You're practicing the freedom of, of religion. But do you know that there's going to come a day when they're going to close the doors on this place? And I don't think we're too far from it. You know, I, I know some of you have heard me say this before, but I want you to just, um, just think about this with me for just a second. Do you understand how rapidly and dramatically things can change with just one, one catalytic move, like a terrorist attack? And all of a sudden, life is entirely different overnight. And things went from life as we know it to a police state. Or how about a, a natural disaster? And then the government, they deploy all their troops and they're addressing things. And everybody has to do exactly what they say until such a time as they say they don't have to do what they say. All I'm saying, all I'm saying is we take a lot of things for granted. And we move ahead sometimes as though things are going to keep on going just like they are. And if you were, if you will pay attention, let me ask you something. <laughs> were things like this when you were a little girl? No way. How about Bob? When, when you were a, a young boy, were things like this? Not even close. 
not even close. Even when I was a boy, not even close. You know, it's, uh, it's a different America. And it's not going to get better. I wish I could tell you that it is. But that's not what the Bible says. It's not going to get better until Jesus sets up his kingdom. Then it will all finally be right. <clears throat> um, you know, oh, there's so much to say. I'm, I'm going to save some comments till later. In, in these United States, you know that in Revelation 13, there are two beasts that are spoken of. In the early part of the chapter, they talk about the beast that comes up out of the water, right? And this is this crazy beast. But in the later part of the chapter, they talk about the beast that comes out of the land. And this is a lamb-like beast, right? So one that would appear to be like Christ. But it spoke how? As a dragon. A lamb-like beast, but it speaks as a dragon. If you will, now we're not going to get into this prophecy today, but I'm going to tell you something. If you haven't been studying the prophecies, you really should. Why? Because they matter and because they are relevant for the time in which we live. We're going to come to these themes very soon in this church. If not sooner, at least by the time we're doing our evangelistic campaign starting September 30. Which I hope you're praying for. By the way, here's a little plug for it. Praying for it, that is. Praying for the meetings right after church today in that back corner room out there in the lobby, in the youth room. Please, if you are willing to stay by and be a part of praying for our coming meetings and the people that should be in them, praying for the health of our church so God can bless us. Stand by after church. But having said all of that, what I want to point out to you is that in these prophecies, when you look out up the symbols and the description of the lamb-like beast, you will find in Revelation 13 that there is no other power on earth that fits that description besides the United States of America. And the United States of America is that beast. And do you know what that beast is involved with? It is involved with <laughs> tactics of you see this down here? It's involved with trying to do this. Bring about a union of church and state. It is involved with coercion. It is involved with laws that fly in the face of the laws of God. It is involved with enforcing those laws to try to get people to come under a, a, a uh, what would you call it? The opposite of heresy. And anyways, coming under a submission to whatever it is that the combined power of church and state is saying is necessary for all people. And of all the nations on the earth, the, the global freedom fighters will be the ones that are enforcing that people have to worship in a certain way. People are not allowed to worship in other ways. There are certain rules that you must follow because church and state have mandated them. I'm not making this stuff up. These are not the rantings of a madman. These are proclamations that come from Scripture. God's laws replaced, it seems crazy. Listen, Bibles, let's talk about this for a minute. Today, the proliferation of the Holy Bible in the United States is higher than at any other point in history. Do you know that it is, it is estimated that there are three, an average of three Bibles in most homes today in the United States? 
But at the same time, the percentage of people who are biblically literate is at an all-time low. Because people do not study their Bibles like they used to. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. I pray that we will be the exception to that rule. That we will be, you know, students rightly dividing the word of truth, right? All right. <clears throat> so the Ten Commandments, you know, have fallen under attack in so many ways. In the last couple of decades, they've been trying to get them out of almost all the courthouses in the land, which is it's crazy because where do they get the laws they're enforcing anyways? Why is it that murderers are told they can't do that? Why is it that murder, murderers, that, that is seen as a, a wrong thing? Because God's Ten Commandments said it was so. That's why. Why is it that uh, adultery is a grounds for divorce? Because originally this was established on God's Ten Commandments. Why is it wrong for me to go and steal something that belongs to you? Same reason. And yet, people want to act like that is antiquated and that it is discriminating and that we should get rid of it. And then let me ask you this. Then what would be the foundation of right and wrong? The collective voice of the moral majority? Who decides what's moral then? <clears throat> Homosexuality. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Do you know? Do you know that it wasn't very long ago? It, it was not very long ago. You don't have to go back but a few decades. And you will find that homosexuality in the United States of America was a crime for which people could go to jail or be imprisoned. A crime. And now, not only is it allowed and accepted, it is actually promoted and celebrated and protected. Right? I'm telling you, this is, this is not the America of my grandparents, this isn't even the America of my childhood. Abortion. I was listening to the radio last week, and I heard the word abortion. I was just flipping through channels. I heard the word abortion, so I turned it up, and it was this talk show, and they were celebrating the great victories they had about offering women choices uh, so that they could, you know, abort the unborn child in their womb. Drugs, do we have a drug problem? Oh, big time, big time. It's, it's actually, if I think too much about it, it scares me to get out there on the road. Because so many people are operating vehicles under the influence of various things, not just alcohol these days, you realize that. People tweaking uh, on methamphetamine and regularly going about their business. All kinds of stuff out there. How about censorship? You know, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, being politically correct. And uh, under the guise of being politically correct, today, when we say things that are plain from the Bible such as among those that are listed that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven are homosexuals. When that is said plainly these days, it is acted as low. Oh, don't say that. That's wrong. Don't say that. That's discriminating. That's hateful. No, that's the word of God. I didn't say something because I despise that person. What I said was something that came from God's word. And we should pay attention to what God's word says because that's the real authority in this life. Amen?
And how about worship? Is, is our worship uh, under threat at all? Do you think so, really? I, I think so. In fact, um, I, I want to say this. Now, I want to be careful in, in one way because I, I realize that in every, I believe in every um, denomination and indeed in, in probably most religions, there are legitimate seekers who want to know God. So this is not a bash on people. But sometimes you have to realize when there is falsehood and a system that is teaching wrong things or doing things that are against what God would have. So I want to point out to you that in some of the most recent papal encyclicals, that there is a rallying cry for the world to come together in many ways, sometimes around causes like uh, that, that have to do with bettering the earth and stuff like that. A rallying cry. And then mingled in there is something that will say, and we should all observe Sunday as the Sabbath. Literally, read some of those encyclicals. I'm not making it up. And we know that God's holy word says, which day is the Sabbath? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And we are, we are instructed in his commands to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, right? And a call to a false Sabbath is a wrong call, friends. It's like warning, warning, warning. It's, it's not okay. You know, if I offend in part, I offend in all, right? So if I keep, if I keep nine commandments, but I steal something that is surrenders, am I keeping the law? No, I've offended in part. So I've offended in all. I've broke his, whole, his law. See, because his commandments are not, they're not multiple choice. They're, they're not, if I get most of them, that's okay. It's all one law, really. He just listed it out as 10, right? But it's all one law. It's his code. It's his covenant for, uh, his, that his people will live by in relationship with him, right? So, today, may God have mercy on us. May he help us to be a commandment-keeping people with the faith of Jesus, who have the faith of Jesus. Amen? I realize the time is kind of slipping away from me, so I'm going to summarize some things. One of the things that I want to point out is that the fall occurred in Genesis chapter 3. You know, this is when sin came into the earth. Adam and Eve were tempted and they succumbed to the temptation. Right? In that chapter, we see the temptation and fall. We see the curse and the bondage that they fall under. And we see the guilt and death that result from their actions. Now, in Romans chapter 8, you actually see the opposite of those things. You see, instead of the temptation and fall, you see yielding and obedience. Instead of the curse and bondage, you see blessing and deliverance. And instead of guilt and death, you see redemption and life. And I want to point out a few things to you in Romans chapter 8. If you have your Bible today, can you say amen? Amen. Let's open them to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, when you're there, could you please say amen? All right. 
One more time. Romans chapter 8. All right, that's more of us. Okay. So, I want, I'm going to pick up in verse 1. Okay? And so, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on, the, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now I want to point out a few things here. First of all, I'm going to go down to verse 11. Stay right there in Romans 8, verse 11. It says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So right here, we have redemption and life, right? You see that He will, the same one who raised Christ will give you life. So we see this coming into play. You see, I'm going to pause, and we're going to return to Romans 8. Don't, don't turn from Romans 8. I want you to realize something. What happened in our country, we can see that when we started in, in the ideals and the principles that we held as a country, from when we started until now, what, what you see in the character and the societal, the fabric of society, it's night and day, it's polar opposites, right? In our country today, isn't that correct? And if, if, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry, who was trying to rally everybody, could look on today and see America as it is. And they were thinking about when they decided that they were going to fight. They were going to fight and it was worth fighting for. And they were going to give their lives, if necessary, to provide us with freedoms. If they looked upon the state of affairs right now, what do you think that they would think? What would you say? What happened? Right. Tears in, their eyes. Tears in their eyes. Man, we need a new revolution, right? But, but so I, I want to say then, how much more? How much more? Because Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate freedom fighter. And how much more when he has gone to the greatest of lengths to provide you and I with the very freedoms that we're reading about here in Romans chapter 8. When he looks upon his people. See, uh, uh, like uh, Washington and Jefferson and, and Patrick Henry, they, they would look and they would say, man, they've, they've, forgotten. they've forgotten what was important. They don't even respect what was important. In fact, it looks like they even despise what's important. Well, then how much more would Jesus look upon his people and, and think they've, they've forgotten? They've forgotten what I fought for when I died for them on Calvary. They've, they've not only seemed to forgot, but they, they don't seem to look upon it with respect. In fact, so many of them despise it. I started out talking to you about Independence Day and the freedoms that are so rapidly slipping away from us. But I really wanted to get to what Jesus died for and the freedoms, the liberties that he wanted to give to you. Do you remember the opening text today that was read from Luke 4.18? Right? Isn't that the text that was read? I came a little late. Luke 4.18? I'm just going to remind you of it real quick. Okay, I'm going back to Romans 8, but I'm flipping to Rome, uh, Luke 4.18 here. 
And it says this. When, this is when Jesus stood up to read uh, in, in the book of Isaiah about himself. And he said, the, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to, listen, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus was the ultimate freedom fighter. He knows what happens with sin. And when we fall under uh, uh, any kind of teaching or guidance that is outside of his will, that's what he came to fight against. That's why he died for you and me, to give us freedom. Going back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I, I just got to, I feel like I got to start over in, in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We are talking about blessing and deliverance right there, friends. Blessing and deliverance. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I praise God for that. I praise God for that. You know, we take so many things for granted. Listen, I, I want to say something very plainly here. Um, you know, when I was a young teen... I thought I had things figured out. You know how it is sometimes. I thought I had things figured out, and I, and I thought that a lot of the rules that were in place were really, you know, restrictions on my freedom. And I, I didn't like that. So I decided that I was going to cast off restraint. And I, I was just going to do things my own way. And, you know, I, w I was warned against things like, like drinking and smoking and, and using drugs and all of that. But I cast it off restraint, and I decided I was going to exercise my freedom. Little did I know that in exercising my freedom, I would fall into bondage. And so what I thought was practicing a principle of liberty, really, I was playing right into the hand of the enemy to become a slave. And I became addicted, and then I was slave to those things. But I do thank God Almighty. I thank, I thank God for sending Jesus and for the powerful word of truth I thank him for reaching into my life and delivering me from those bondages. I now live in this freedom that he talks about. So we see here, contrasted with what happened in Genesis and Romans 8, you have that whole different set. The law of liberty sets us free from the law of sin and death that came into play in Genesis 3. Now in Galatians 5, I'd like to turn there. Galatians chapter 5. If you're there, say amen. All right. All right, check this out. In Galatians chapter 5, it says to do what? Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Look down at verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Listen, this is what I want you to know real quick from this. It is not about legalism. It's never going to be about legalism that we find our freedom. Do you realize that? That's not where your freedom and your salvation is. In being a, a, a legalist, a rule keeper, that somehow you're saved because eventually you got it together enough to know how to behave well enough so that you could be saved. That is never, ever going to be the case. The scripture says you are saved by 
grace. And you can't earn grace. You are saved by grace through faith. Amen? It is the gift of God. Not of works. Now, I want you to realize something else, though. So we know it's not legalism. But look down in the chapter to verse 16. In verse 16 it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These two, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Oh, there you go. So you're not under the law if you're led by the Spirit, right? Now listen, out here, there's a speed limit, right? There's a speed limit, and I can drive it every day. That law is always there. I can drive that speed limit every day and never have a problem with that speed limit, even though that law exists. But if I go blazing down there 70 miles an hour and I get pulled over by the Joplin Police Department, I am going to fall under the law under the law because the law is there it's always there and when i violate it now i come under the law do you understand all right now going back to galatians 5 here i, I want to pick up in um verse 25 it says if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that mean? If it is the Spirit who is going to give you life, do you have life apart from the Spirit of God? And if it is the Spirit who is going to give you life, you must begin to walk with Him. God is calling us. Did you see all those things that He lists that are, are works of the flesh that we're not supposed to be involved with? Things like adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, just to name a few. The list goes on and on. These are works of the flesh. We're not supposed to walk in the flesh. We're supposed to walk in the Spirit, right? You know what's amazing? It's not just that I'm going to decide to do what's right. It's that I'm going to ask God. I'm going to confess to Him that I need His help. I need to have His Spirit living in me and helping me to walk in the way that is honoring and pleasing to Him. And God will answer that prayer. Of course He wants you to walk in the Spirit. Of course He wants you to walk in paths of righteousness. He came to provide the opportunity for you to do exactly that. He wants you to be free from the law of sin and death so that you are not caught in bondage and you have to live out sinful things. He came to free you from that. So, you see, it is not a call to legalism, to salvation by, you know, my conduct, nor is it a call to liberalism, that I can do whatever I want because he took care of business. It is a call to understand that when you live by the law of the life, the spirit of life, it will change your life. Not only does it free you from the penalty that you deserve because the wages of sin is death, but it will also cause you to walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We're about to close. This is the last slide today. Let's turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. John, chapter 17. When you're there, could you say amen, please?
think I might have heard three. If you're there, amen? amen. There's more. Great. John 17, 17. Jesus is speaking here. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What does that word sanctify mean, friends? Set apart. Set apart for holy use. Make it holy. That's right. Sanctify them by what? Your truth. Your word is truth. Listen. I want you to understand something, brothers and sisters. The times, they are a change in. Life will not keep looking like it does today. Things about your civil and religious freedoms will continue to erode until authorities are trying to coerce you to comply with standards that are set up that fly in the face of what God's word says. This, my friends, is the only book that is able to make you wise unto salvation. We should be students of it. Especially, especially, listen, are you listening to me up there in the balcony too? Listen, we should be students of this book while there is relative peace. While you are not fighting to find a place to worship. While government authorities are not trying to seek you out. Look into God's word. Memorize passages of it. Take it to heart. And most importantly, live according to what it says. Don't just know it. We're not to be hearers only, but doers, right? Not forgetful hearers. Let's now look to John chapter 8. Staying right there in the Gospel of John, going back a few chapters to chapter 8. When you're there, could you please say amen? All right, looking at John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now listen. Listen to the reply. I find this really interesting. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? I'm going to stop right there to say this. The Jews are replying, hey, hey, we come from Abraham. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And it's like they don't even recognize that they're under Roman rule right now. Right? They're under Roman rule when this conversation is taking place. And, the, and they view themselves as being free. And you know, you could plug in, hey, you know, we're, we're Americans. We're Americans. We've never been in bondage to anyone. But I'm going to tell you something right now. The bondage that is upon this nation and that is tightening its grip most people are turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to. Doesn't make it not exist. It makes it like this. Look what Jesus goes on and says. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I want to point out this to you, friends, brothers and sisters. I prescribe to you today the Word of God Almighty. I want to encourage you to study the Word of God. Take time every day. Fill your mind with the truths of God's Word. Meditate upon His promises. 
figure out, you know, how do I adapt my life so I can live by those pr uh, principles that are there listed? Take the word of God. It is your only safety in the days that are coming upon us. I am not trying to be a, a, a fanatic in terms of, oh no, there's, there's big trouble. I am saying, right now, today is the day of salvation. Take the word and put it in your mind. Let its transforming influence renew your mind and change your heart so that you are ready for what is soon to fall upon this world. I want to close with this final text. It's right there at the beginning. Right there at the beginning of Romans chapter 8. And I just want you to... I, I, actually, I want to encourage you. I, I want to challenge you. I want to exhort you to commit this passage to memory. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And it says... Oh, I'm, I'm in John. I'm going back to Romans. I beg your pardon. Romans chapter 8. If you're there, could you say amen? amen? Verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I want you to realize that I believe that is more, I believe that is more than just the punishment that goes along with sin and death. It is the practice and the experience of sin and death. In other words, God intends to make you free so that you are not in bondage to stay in the same sinful habits and failing patterns that you have that have held you in bondage before. He has come to set you free from that. And it's not just some future event. It is a present experience for you and I. If we will believe Him. If we will believe Him. Do you believe on the name of Jesus Christ? Amen. Do you believe that He who called Lazarus forth from the grave can speak victory into your life? Amen. So do I. So do I. And I don't know about you, brother, sister. As for me, I have realized that I resonate with the statement of Patrick Henry, only it's kind of got a little different meaning on it. It says, give me liberty or give me death. But I realize either I'm going to experience the liberty that Jesus came to give me, or guess what? I'm headed for death. But there's no reason, there is no reason that you and your household would have to experience death. In the permanent sense. You know what I'm saying, right? That God can give us life. Eternal life. And freedom to live today walking in the Spirit. If you want that today, will you just stand with me? Let's take our stand. I know this has been a, a rather lengthy message, and I thank you for paying attention. I believe that this is very, very important. And I want to pray a prayer of blessing over us right now in Jesus' name. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we have looked today into the issues of liberty. We've looked at the threats that come into play that would take from us the, the liberties that our forefather, forefathers fought, fought to give us. That so many people died to ensure that we could have. So much blood was shed 
to provide us with the freedoms that we're exercising even in this very moment. But most of all, we think about the ultimate freedom fighter. We think of, of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And we recognize that he has died to provide us with freedom. Freedom from the law of sin and death so that it doesn't rule in our members and it does not get the last word. But Lord, that you would have your way in our lives. We want to open ourselves up to you today and say, Lord, please, we, we just want to have the right kind of heart and mindset to receive your truth into our lives, to receive the gift of deliverance that you long to give to us, to, to embrace and, and remember and respect and honor in the way that we live the fact that Jesus has paid the ultimate price to provide us this amazing freedom. I pray, Father, right now in this place, there are so many people, so many families here represented. There's so much trouble and turmoil that has happened in, in the families that are in this place. The people falling under all kinds of oppression and suffering and degradation and bondage because of the enemy. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak your words of victory into the lives of this church family. I pray, Father, that you will deliver us from the efforts of the evil one, that you will be the victor that fights on our behalf and you will rebuke the adversary. And there, there, can, there can be a, a mighty uh, empowering of this, your living church, that we would go forth in the spirit and in the power of God, proclaiming your message and living out your truth and living a faithful witness as we walk in the spirit because you have freed us. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please remain standing. We will sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn today is number 647 in your hymnal. Number 647. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this Independence Day, I want to encourage you to take time to reflect upon, you know, what was really given up to provide you with the freedom that you enjoy. Take time to thank God that you still have freedoms. Freedoms to read the word. Freedoms to come and gather and worship. Freedoms to proclaim things publicly. Freedoms 
that came at a very expensive cost. But what's more, take time to think about the ultimate freedom fighter. Take time to think about what it was he fought for, for you. To give you freedom and victory that you could live in liberty from the practice and presence of sin in your own life. And that he would lead you in paths of righteousness all the way into his kingdom. Will you be mindful of that this Independence Day? Maybe as the fireworks are going off and, and you're thinking about the bombs bursting in air. Just reflect on these themes. God bless you. God bless us all.